Everland was a free social MMO created by a studio that the streamer Wreckful, Byron Bernstein, founded. It aimed to bring players together to make friends in an online world. However, with Wreckful's untimely passing in 2020, Everland was left unfinished, unreleased, and unable to even be logged into if you still had a copy, as the servers were shut down after the public stress test. I'll be explaining the process of creating a server emulator for a game using only the client. This is possible because the client inherently knows both how to send messages to the server and decode the information that the server sends back. This means that all the protocols, data structures, and communication patterns are embedded within the client. By leveraging this information, we can recreate the server-side logic to handle these interactions, making it feasible to build a functional server emulator to preserve Everland and ensure that Recful's vision lives on. It's a very pretty game with good music, so it'd be great if people could still experience it. After obtaining the client, I wanted to identify which version it was. Using SteamDB, I checked the files against the build dates and found it to be version May 17th, 2020. Steam games can easily be converted to run offline with a few simple tweaks if they don't implement any extra DRM. The client I got already had that patched out, so we have the game and it launches offline. Very good. Everland was developed in the Unity engine, which is great for me because I already have experience making my own game. First I use DNSpy, a .NET decompiler that also has some built-in debugging features specifically for Unity. It's amazing software. I watched a quick DEF CON talk, reverse engineering c -sharp and modifying Unity 3D games, which gave me a basic rundown on using it. Unity games have all of their code compiled into an assembly c -sharp DLL. The talk also explained how to load a custom DLL, which I used to add my own debug console. This console printed out the unity debug.log into a file, which I then made into a simple console that refreshed every few seconds to watch the data being printed into the file. Using dnspy, I searched for some easily visible strings from the login screen to find where those messages were being sent from. For example, when you attempt to log in and it times out, there's a message, request timed out, server may be offline, or connection timed out. Initially, I couldn't find these strings because the client had some obfuscation that encrypted strings. This required me to write a decryptor. So I created a standalone decryptor using the mono.math library by copying the decryption code from the client. Exporting the assembly c -sharp to a new file, I ran the decryptor on all the files to enable future searches and make things easier. Once the strings were decrypted, I was able to find the server configuration. It looked like this. You could patch in a different server URL, but it's just as easy to change how your computer will connect to the existing address. To redirect api.live.playoverland.com to our local server, we need to modify our host file and set up HTTPS. SSL is a standard security protocol for establishing encrypted links between clients and servers. It ensures that all of the data transmitted between the web server and the client remains encrypted. When you try and emulate a server, uh, specifically one that uses HTTPS, you need to have a valid SSL certificate for the domain you're emulating, in this case api.playeverland.com, but since we don't actually own that domain, the browser or our game won't trust our self-signed certificate by default. To overcome this, we generate a self-signed certificate and install it on our local machine. This way, our local environment will trust the certificate, allowing HTTPS connections to be established successfully. Now that our client is connecting to the local web server, we can examine the data that it sends during the login request and send back some spoof data that it wants to continue the login flow. If we don't return a character, the client will enter the character creator. If we do return a character, the client goes directly into the game. The final request is for a slash gateway slash endpoint WebSocket server. So we return an address for a locally hosted WebSocket server as well, and the game continues to the loading screen. After we start up our WebSocket server, we receive this message. This message has three parts to it. The opcode at the beginning, the length of the message, and then the encoded protobuf message. The opcode and length act as a kind of header here. From the C-sharp disassembly, we can see that this is an established session request. Everland uses Google Protocol Buffers, or Protobuf, to encode and decode messages between the server and client. It's crucial to maintain the order of fields in the protobuf message because the order dictates how the data is serialized and deserialized. Here's an example of defining a protobuf message. 
When encoding a message, the fields must be set in the order defined in the protobuf schema. Any discrepancy in the order or incorrect data types will lead to a corrupt message and miscommunication between the client and server. Using the structure shown in the client, we are able to craft an established session response and send it back. We also needed to send a game session open message and after some trial and error and formatting test data, creating a Pong message, we finally get into the game. The first observation after getting into the game is that our character is naked despite setting items on them. Also, the client keeps sending 101,012 packets when moving, likely character position updates. First, let's put some clothes on with a character appearance updated event of ourselves. I needed to dump the ID to GUID table to get the IDs for the items that I should be using. Here it's important to note that since I was using Node.js as my server, that GUID needed to be wrapped inside of a long, since JavaScript doesn't have a native representation for it, and it was causing some issues with garbled data since the numbers were being encoded in the protobuf wrong. Then, I disabled the stress test text in the top left corner. My first instinct was that this was TextMesh Pro UGUI, since that's what I'm using for my game. After the loading screen finishes, I search for all of the available text meshes and compare the strings to disable the one that I'm looking for. Next, let's get chat working. First, we see a get channels request being sent from the client. Then we get an update channel request, which actually joins the chat channel, but we can't talk yet. Of course, it had something to do with the channel flags, so after checking that out, they appear to be some control bits. Sure enough, we simply didn't have permission to talk yet, so we give the player full permission, and now we can chat. The numbers here are clear power of two values, which means that each bit in the stream represents a specific attribute for the channel. Did you know that that's actually what the chmod or FTP file permissions mean? When you say chmod777, that 7 actually represents a 3-bit value, which stands for read-write-execute. So 7 here in the simplified case would mean that they're all enabled, 111. Same idea here. From here, I went to work on getting multiple clients into the same world. I wasn't able to open multiple clients at once on my PC, so I needed to run a virtual machine, which I pointed at the same server. Our test data and character needed to be substituted out for a real server-side representation now, since we don't want these players to have overlapping player ID. So we simply moved those into a real object. GPT-4 took care of moving the characters into a server-side representation and keeping track of the WebSocket sessions so that we could add a broadcast message function, which would send data to all connected clients. This was useful for sending updates of player positions or entities joining the world. Next was adding player movement. I got stuck here and needed to reference another server, the Cerulean server's code. Since I wasn't able to find the opcodes for the entity movement packets, the developer of Cerulean had already found that they are dynamic starting at 101,000 and incrementing upwards by one for each opcode. After implementing that and broadcasting position updates to the other players, I was able to have my two clients be able to chat and move around. Our server emulator isn't fully implemented, but provides basic functionality to connect to the game and explore the world. There are already more complete emulators available, so this project was to demonstrate how a server emulator can be created by referencing just the data that's available inside of the client itself. Not every game is this straightforward to emulate. For example, some games have encrypted region files that are nearly impossible to decrypt without the keys or entities that are spawned by the server and need to be manually placed once again by your re-implementation. If you're interested in exploring this project further or contributing to its development, check out the GitHub link below. But do note that I'm not distributing the client, just the server, so you'll need to find that on your own. If you want to try the game, check out Neverland, which to my knowledge is the most complete re-implementation. Neverland is also affiliated with the Recful Archive, which holds a collection of VODs, YouTube content, and Recful's other online presences. They also have a community that watches VOD reruns. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace.